So there's the link to the Stite deck if you want to grab it. And I guess I can start. All right, so I'm Shang Si Yu, and I work at SUSE on the BPF stack. And an important part of working on the BPF stack is for us is to backport the CVE fixes, so the important security fixes. And most of the time, that ends up being somewhere in the verifier. So, like the verifier is understandable once you get past the psychological barrier to look into it. But after a while, you start to have some wishes, at least for me. So I would wish that the verifier is simpler, um, more people understand it, so could review it, and thereby reducing the bug count. And also, I hope there will be more thorough testing for the same reason. And the third one is actually already realized. This is realized in two forms. First is the ACNI, which is the formal verification of BPF verifier itself. And that has been uh, addressed in Daniel's opening talk. And the other is the range bound tester by Andrew and others, I believe also in this room. And so that left me with just two wishes. I wish that it's simpler and more people understand it. And here I will try to address the first wish, it's in the simplification part. So if you look at the complexity of the BPF verifier, it's steadily increasing. Um, this is by Paul from Isovalent. So, so if, uh, just, just because basically we have more feature in BPF. So it's just, it's just bound to happen that the BPF verifier gets more complicated. And so what the way I try to tackle this is I look into what I know about the BPF verifier, which is a lot of parts. And the only that the only part that I felt that I know enough is value tracking. So that's what I try to tackle here. And value tracking is used uh, it's one of the core, I guess, routines or the libraries called that is used for us to keep track of the pointer. So to determine whether a pointer access or write or read is out of bound, we use value tracking to keep track of what, what value may be in the register at certain point of time, certain point of execution. And this is done by, uh, this is tracked inside the BPF reg state structure, and we have five kind of different way to track them. I call them, uh, we usually call them bounds, so five different kinds of bounds. And it used, to be, it used to look something else, totally different, but that's in the past. So the first thing that I would like to talk about is TNOMs. So, this is short for tri-state number or track number, depend on how you want to call it. And it has two fields. Um, the first is the mask, well, the second is the mask. And it checks which bits are unknown to the verifier. The other is the value, which checks what the actual value may be if it's known. So it's easier to see an example. The bits can be either known to be zero or one, or it could be unknown. So if, we, if we're pretty sure about the value that can be in the register, uh, the mask will be zero on set, and the value would be the actual value that should be in the register. However, sometimes we couldn't be sure what the actual value in the register are, so we have multiple guesses that that multiple value that could be in the register. In this case, the mask will be set somewhere where the bit is unknown. And the possible value is just, you just go through all the possible combination of the unknown bit, which is either zero or one. And that is TNUM. Up next, we have the min and max value. Uh, this, usually we are using the unsigned 64 bit min and max. And these are usually called the range. Or if you look into kind of the academic literature on abstract interpretation, it will be called the interval domain. And it does what you would expect. 
So it have a minimum and maximum. If minimum and maximum is the same, then you're pretty sure there's only one kind of value possible in the register. And we track actually four different kind of range. So unsigned, signed, and 64-bit, 32-bit, all of them. And what value tracking we have in the, the verifier essentially is just some efficient data structure and algorithm to track, uh, to track a set of values. But the efficiency actually comes from a trade-off. The trade-off is that we couldn't precisely track the set. So for example, for a range, if you say I have a, I have a set value that is 1 and 3, and you try to turn it into min and max, you actually you will end up with an extra element, which is 2, which is not there before. That is the loss of precision. And the same thing for a tnum. If you try to have if you have a set that is either one or two, and you try to turn a tnum and then turn it back, you realize that you have actually four values now, zero to three. And that is not ideal, but that is kind of fine because when we track more than the possible when we track more value than the possible set of value that could be there, uh, we kind of like checking more conditions. So it is fine. On the other way around, if we track kind of less value, then that's problematic because that means that uh, there are some cases that the verifier is not tracking. And the reason that we have both tnum and range is that they have different properties. So in certain cases, uh, using range to track things might not be that precise, especially if you want to know if the pointer is aligned to a certain bit. And in other cases, the range actually is more precise. It provides a better understanding of the value that could be in the register. So these combined give us a much, uh, much better picture of the value. And the reason that we have signed and unsigned range, I believe, is that we, we have unsigned and signed um, conditional instructions. And when they operate on the same register, which, which could happen, uh, it's, uh, we, we end up deciding to check both signed and unsigned range. And the same goes for 64-bit and 32-bit. We have both kind of uh, both both jump for 64-bit and jump for 32-bit, which only looks at the lower part of the register. And so that brings me to my proposal. So the proposal here is to track less bounds, and the. The reason that I'm proposing this is because one of the complexity, it seems, is that we track so many bounds at, at the same time, we need to synchronize the knowledge between each of the bounds. And this is done inside the reg bound sync uh, function. So we, we, after we run through instruction, we'll gain some new knowledge. And this knowledge can be be in just maybe in only one part of the bound, maybe in one of the bounds. And so we need to synchronize this knowledge. So first we go from tnum and try to synchronize into the ranges. Then within the ranges, we do some synchronization, then back to tnum and tnum once back to the range. So there's a lot going on. And as an example, the way we synchronize knowledge from the unsigned 64-bit into signed 64-bit is something like this. So we try to look at the unsigned min and max and see if it actually falls with fine within the signed ranges. And if it, if it falls fine within the signed ranges, we try to update the sign part, try to kind of like narrow the bound of what we think it could, the value could be. And the same goes for the signed values. We could use that, interpret it as the unsigned value, see if it's a 
salad range and then try to narrow down. So this actually comes at the expense of a potentially like 20 weight synchronization. Although we, I think we're not doing the bottom one, which is using the sine range to synchronize back to antenna, but there's still a lot. And in order to do less propagation, one thing that should work is to use less bound. And this, I think, could be done. We could get rid of the sine bound tracking data structure and, and twist how we use to track on sign ranges. So right now, we couldn't have on sign range where the minimum is greater than the maximum. It, it just doesn't make sense. But if we allow this, this, this rule to be broken, we can actually track the sign range within the on sign range. So I think a better picture is like this. So say if you have uh, the minimum is u min minus one and max is zero, then you try to iteratively count from there. So uh, u max minus one, then plus one you have u max, then plus one you go to zero. So that is now a valid range we track. And the other way that you could look into it is it's kind of like an inverted range that we track. So, so you, the other way to look at it is to you start from the full set of value from zero to u max, and you have to like you minus those numbers that are are seen between w one and then u max minus two. So, if we allow this, then the unsigned ranges actually stores a perfectly valid sign range here. And if we, if we do this, then we're only left with street bounds. And street bound is actually much easier. We just have a six, yeah, six way sync synchronization. And I think this would also help with the ACNE, the formal verifier on the BPF verifier itself, because there should be theoretically less code paths that would go through, and therefore it should verify faster. And uh, I have previously posted this patch ba uh, back in, I think, November, and unfortunately I couldn't find time to work on it before this. But one of the findings was that there's a paper in the 2015 that, that exactly described how to do this. They call it rap, uh, rapid range, and they have shown that it works. And my proposal would be just, just use the same name and go from there. And one of the one of the benefit is that if we use this if we unify these sign and unsigned range into rapid range it could actually make all the all the functions that try to track individual bpf instruction and update knowledge also simpler so the addition right now looks like this for 32 bit and if we use rapid range it could be much simpler we just track the kind of like track, check the overflow once. Then we just, if it doesn't overflow, we can just add in the minimum and maximum. And so, the plan for this to to like to to have this upstream uh, is to try to make the rapid range fit into the current ecosystem because we already have a, a quite complete self test. And the way I think that it could work is that I come up with a helper function that tries to turn the range, the unsigned range and signed range we have right now into a rapid range. And after I have this helper function, I can kind of uh, sneak the rapid range 
functions inside our usual functions and have have it run internally from there, then go back to the usual BPF range uh, state we tried. And, and with that, I should be able to run the self-test and see if that works. So one of the major concerns is that we are actually not that sure uh, what the what hidden assumption we have on the BPF register value tracking mechanisms. For example, like uh, does the unsigned range and signed range always intersect if you look if you look at them as purely bit patterns? And that is I do not know, so if somebody knows, uh, please suggest. But that's that would be a major concern, and that's the first proposal. The the second proposal is orthogonal to the last, is to try to find a way to abstract the value tracking details. So right now, if you try to work with the verifier, you kind of have to know how TNUM and range work. Uh, you have to decide like you have to know either you use umin or you use the TNUM value, et cetera, et cetera. And the proposal here is just to sweep everything under a corporate, call it TFAL, not very creative. Um, but the good thing about this is that we could abstract away the implementation details. For example, right now we have an scalar branch taken function which is used to, for the verifier to decide whether the branching is taken. It could either be the branch is always taken or it's never taken, which is great because it helps us prune the possible, possible, I guess, states that could exist. Or, or sometimes we just couldn't determine a good answer and say that, oh, okay, maybe both, both branch will be taken. And if we kind of sweep everything under tfal, we could come up with a function tfal intersect, which is kind of like tnum intersect with a different twist. So the tfal intersect will return a value that indicates whether the, an intersection of the two uh, value tracking ranges can be found. And this is needed because right now the data structure we have cannot accurately represent a, an empty set, empty set. So if there is an empty set, empty set, um, all hell go, goes loose, like failure tracking just fails to work. So we need to check that. And the good thing about this, uh, this helper function and the abstraction is that we could use the same thing for a later part of the BPF verifier, which is when it tries to update the knowledge based on the fact that, uh, based on the assumption when a certain branch is taken. So this can be changed into the same TFAL intersect function, and, and we go on from there. So I, based on my understanding, like. If we want to abstract away the details, we will need to come up with these helper functions. And the t file intersect and t file diff is probably quite vital for the conditional, uh, the, the branching statement decision. And, but the good thing is that they could come with the must check uh, attribute. So the return value should always be tracked checked by the developer, and we wouldn't end up with a situation where there's an empty set and everything goes wrong. Oh, just a question, a clarification question. Are, are you suggesting removing the, the signed and unsigned tracking for TNUM only, or are you like refactoring those checks into these, these helpers? So, so in this part, it's actually just uh, suggesting to refactor. So th this is kind of like a two separate proposal. Um, this part is trying to suggest that we, we, just, we just come up with the helper for refactoring. But the last part is trying to suggest 
to unify the unsigned and signed for the range. Okay, so the, the, the first one proposal was like a, a, a unification of some, some bounds, and the second proposal is a uh, refactoring of the, of the code, basically. Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Yeah, so uh, let me continue from them. So, so some question remain, like how much abstraction is too much abstraction? And is the must check semantic like two for both? And that is actually the main, main proposal I have. I have some other topics that would be nice to discuss and might make the maintainers frown but I'll, I'll stop here right now and see if there's any question, comment. Maybe let's go through the other topics first. Okay, sure, sure, sure. Great. So, so the first thing I really want to discuss is, oh, sorry, the documentation improvement. So right now there's, there's documentation for a BPF verifier in the the documentation directory. And there's also a whole chunk of like comments we have in the code, which I, I think many of them are kind of outdated, I'm not sure. But I just wonder like is there like how do we how do we decide what kind of documentation lives in the code and where which live in the I guess the RSD documentation and and what, like, what updates are, are, are most important, I guess? I think it's a subjective question, but in my opinion, it's better usually for documentation to go in the code where it's appropriate. I mean, for something like the verifier, semantics are one thing, but the implementation details and how it's built, that's what I would consider an implementation detail, and so it's probably better to have like a really comprehensive kind of description or layout of the flow of the verifier and whatnot be located in verifier.c. It's just my take, I guess. I saw that you had a bullet point on standardizing the verifier, so I'll have yeah, to yeah. comment on that in the next slide. Yeah, and I guess it, like the documentation kind of goes hand in, well not, kind of related with the standardization of the verifier because the, I, I would guess these the standardization will contain kind of like a high level overview of how the verifier should work on a high level maybe. I'm sort of wondering um, like uh, let, let's say for, for standardization like is the goal well, you started your, your, your talk kind of talking about how, how do we make BPF more approachable or, or easier to reason about. So are, are we thinking about the output the verifier gives to the developer and then making that kind of standard so that people know how to interact with BPF? Or are we talking about standardizing like implementation details, algorithms, or, or like what, what are we looking to do here? I think I'll let Dave answer it. So the... Uh IETF standardization effort that I'll talk about tomorrow when we look at the BPF working group charter. Um, there is uh, a document uh, needed, meaning there's a bullet item with no document that's verifier expectations. It is um, not a standard, it is informational. It's, I mean, currently the IETF has not agreed to do, proposed standards agreed to do informational. And so it's a documentation about uh, verifier expectations and building blocks for allowing safe execution of untrusted BPF programs. That's what it says right now. So how do you take an untrusted program, verify it, and so what are the expectations around any verifier, as opposed to standardizing, here's how you must do a verifier. Um, now, that's just what it says right now. Feel free to argue for anything else or whatever. It just means the, the bar to change it from informational, you know, a documentation about the verifier to a standard, you must do it. You must meet the following properties. We don't care how you meet the following properties, but you must meet the following properties. You can argue for that. It just means you'll have to make an argument to change the charter, so. Well, yeah, I mean, chart, so my personal opinion, charter aside, I, I don't think that we should standardize the, the behavior of the verifier. I mean, the verifier is, is 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 verifying semantics, right? So like, 
if you want to if you want to standardize on expected semantics, like I know that like so for example, divide by zero just returning zero. That's in the ISA document, but that used to be something we considered about having in like a verifier doc. I don't know. To me, that's the proper part of it to like to standardize. If you have BTF, what kind of behavior should you expect in terms of like what a call instruction does to a function that has BTF values? Like that's a much more natural thing to to standardize on and the verifier can choose to do whatever it wants. I mean it can choose to reject it, it could choose to log it. It's it's a to me that's really a, like a platform specific uh, like nice to have even I would say honestly. Not like a core part of BPF necessarily. Okay. Um, that might be a hot take, I don't know. Yeah, I would say the important part in my mind that you kind of alluded to is which things are the job of the verifier versus the job of something else? Like you mentioned, like divide by zero used to be the job of the verifier, but it's not anymore, right? To say what is the job of the verifier and what is the job of something else, right? And this will uh, be important once we do the architecture slash roadmap, which tries to put all the pieces together to make sure that there's a clear division of labor, right? So. Exactly. By the way, if you want to document the verifier, that'd be, I would review your patches. That'd be awesome. Please do. <laughs> I think that would be, everybody would benefit a lot from that. Yeah, I, I, so, so this is just a fake idea. Like, I was wondering, maybe it's possible to have a very simple high-level implementation of the BPF verifier using, using the tools that are used for formalification uh, like Z3 or SMB, oh, yeah, basically Z3. So with Z3, you could say that, um, with Z3, one of the things you could say that is that um, register, value of register in A and B um, added together divided by two is greater than three. That's something you could say. And, it defer, and the Z3 will infer that A plus B equals six. And then if you follow up with a knowledge saying that A equals two, then it can infer that B equals four. But that, that's like a validation of conformance with the instruction set, right? Like, because those have well-defined semantics. And so if you wanted to verify that a broken, like, I guess I'm not quite following. I mean, if you, if you added numbers and they didn't equal what the semantics of the add instruction do. I, I think. Well, uh, I, I I might misunderstand you, but but my understanding is that if you have if you have a description of how the instructions should behave in something like these three, you basically have the verifier. That not plus, necessarily plus not necessarily. minus a few things. Because like consider like you can do a memory write to an invalid address and crash the kernel, but you're like the instruction is pretty clear. Yeah, you're doing a write to memory, but it's unsafe, right? So the verifier isn't necessarily about implementing like that. I would say the JIT is more about what you're thinking in terms of implementing um, implementing uh, conformance to some instruction set. But the verifier, yeah, it's it's I think it's about validation that it's safe and that this actually should be running. It shouldn't be running. And again, it's yeah, it's does that make sense? Uh, not, you, not not yet, but I, I guess I guess what I imagine would be after you have the the behavior of the instruction, one thing you could add is that the so 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 I'm actually talking about a very simple BPF verifier implementation, and what I was trying to get to. Um, is that we might be able to come up with a very simple BPF verifier implementation with very few lines of code, and that could be useful for standardization. Might not be, be it might not become the standardization itself, but it will have very little implementation details, and and still at the same time, it's kind of like a working verifier. But yeah, I guess I'd have to see what. Like learn more about it, and I guess I don't know enough to to map it to something concrete. So yeah, I, I was okay. I was wondering, did you? Uh, 
uh, run this proposal through Agni, like the, that you had earlier on the on the ref refactorings and simplifications for the wrapped range, or no, no, not yet. I, think I, it would I probably hope be useful. to hope to have this soon. Yeah, I I think running it through Agni should be quite refilling. Like either it's good or bad, it should be quite like it will give a verdict which is trustworthy. So, so maybe one more thing. So, like th there was a graph that I showed that tried to track the complexity of the BPA verifier over each version. So I was wondering, like, maybe that's something we could have. Um, we could be tracking as a BPA verifier. In well, we could be tracking in the BPF subsystem. Sort of, I, what I would imagine is that maybe each kernel release we review the complexity changes, maybe increase by 10%, 20%, and we look at it. Maybe there's no direct action, but at least we could have a better sense of how complex we're going. I'm just going to add a quick comment on the removing the TNUM. Um, Maybe even I can maybe be able to find the thread, but there was a, when we added the ALU32, there's a long thread about why we need the TNUM. Um, unfortunately, removing it actually breaks real programs. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the and the test if you if you actually do it in the test, you, the self test should flag it as well. Okay. So like, if you actually try that exercise, remove the TNUMs, think that you fixed everything up straight. Um, the self test should highlight the like concrete examples that. Um, that have forced the TNUM to stay there. And, okay. and actually, I think the comments, just if you search the, t the test, the range test and the balance test, there should be some comment about like, um, this test requires TNUM because TNUM and, you know, resolves some extra things that the Minimax, uh, the Minimax can't cover. What's that? But you, you need both, right? So DNAM, like what it provides that like the, the normal ranges cannot, right, is the uh, multiple of two, four, yeah. eight, and so on. And I think we do have checks like that. So when you have some pointer, uh, I don't remember, like SK buff or something, right? Like we check that the pointer is, the reference pointer is a properly aligned, basically. So, so at least that, and maybe there are, I mean, minimax, I would say, like if you have some divergence in minimax, we should fix that because conceptually the ranges should provide like as tight uh, boundaries as, as TDAM. Like if you can, so if you can derive like some upper bits being zero or ones, right, the, the range, normal range logic should be able to derive this as well, conceptually at least. I agree, <laughs> but uh, there's a. I have to go back and look at the thread. There was like, there is like a concrete example. My, my memory is that there's a concrete example that we had from Cilium where that was that we somehow that was not the How case. How long ago was that? What's that? How long ago was that? That was before your last changes. So you well, might exactly, have fixed right? it. Up. So we, we did a yeah. lot of changes yeah. that, to like make the ranges yeah. more precise. So, uh, so maybe but it's at resolved. the very least, right? Like you you cannot remove this uh, alignment check, okay. pointer alignment check. Okay. Um, one one other thought. Uh, I definitely agree that we could simplify and refactor the uh, the verifier. You know, right right now th this is like a hand wavy observation, but right now it feels like it's very like there isn't like an overall well defined flow of what happens in the verifier. Like you do the check and then you do a bunch of stuff and you like you bootstrap stuff and then you start to check subprogs and like it's it's like a stream of consciousness <laughs> a little bit i would say um and that's fine but I, I think that yeah like the verifier definitely would benefit a lot from somebody taking a big step back like and really putting a lot of structure in terms of what what it means to like build this model of a program and then you know like interpret that like figure out what's what's you know have like a really well defined series of steps to to follow what verifying actually means cuz right now you just have to kind of follow the code and like it's tough, yeah. So I, I guess one of the 
problem with 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 having the, a better like one of the problem with trying to do simplification and refactoring is that it's it's, it's hard to have the whole picture of of the fair fair, so it's hard to do. That's I why guess. yeah, that's why yeah. it's important but also difficult. So I I don't really know where to start except on the failure tracking part because it's kind of like the independent and isolated part of the fair fire. You do it in pieces, right? I mean, like figure out what would be the ideal state, try to set it up and then slowly move things into the state and I don't know. I mean, <laughs> good question. I, I guess I don't know. Yeah. It's a huge it's a huge file. Yeah, it'll take a lot of work to, to refactor it for sure. All right, and I, I'm almost time. Let me just have a shameless plug that because I'm based in Taiwan, so if if there would be BPF, BOF, bird of feather, and and where close to me, that would be great. So if someone could come, that would be awesome. And other than that, I think. That's about the time for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.